The title for the lesson in your bulletin and on the sign outside is uh, uh, Why the Church of Christ? Why the Church of Christ? Um, but the real title should be uh, Why I am a member of the uh, Church of Christ as opposed to being something else, as opposed to being you know, a, a, a Catholic why am I not a Catholic? Uh, why, am, why am I not a Baptist? Uh, why am I not part of the Pentecostal uh, congregation? Or why am I not a Hindu? Why, why am I not a Muslim? Why am I not these things? Why am I not part of one of the 12 major religious groups in the, uh, in the world, in the hundreds and hundreds of sub groups that emanate from those uh, 12 uh, major. Why, why the Church of Christ? I, I used the shortened version, why the Church of Christ, so it could fit on the sign, uh, basically. And in the limited space that we have for the sermon uh, in the bulletin. The idea, of course, is not new. Several books and tracts have been written over the years under this title or something similar to this title. And I'm sure that I'm not the first preacher to ever speak on the subject. You know, why am I a member of the Church of Christ? The impulse to do so, however, came to me as I spoke to someone about their family's religious background. You know how you do, how you doing, nice, where are you from? You know, your folks, your people, you know, are they members of the church? You know, how did you come to Christ? You know, uh, talking about that, and they said something that I had heard too many times before. In uh, speaking to this uh, young man who was a member uh, of the church, but whose in-laws were Baptists, he said the following. He says, uh, when I visit my in-laws, well, I just go to the Baptist church with them. After all, aside from the piano, there's no real difference between them and us. How many times have we heard people say that? I certainly, I certainly have heard that over and over again. What's the difference? You know, I mean, the piano, it's about it. Everything else is pretty much the same. The buildings are the same, you know, the routine is the same. We're the same, it's all the same, isn't it? We went on to talk about other things but inwardly I marveled at how someone who had supposedly grown up in the church could be so uninformed, could be so mistaken about what the church is and how it is different uh, than other groups. His comment about us being practically the same as our Baptist neighbors made me question again why I am a member of the Church of Christ and not some other group. And, and I, can, I can make that argument because uh, I became a Christian when I was you know, 30 years old. Uh, I had sought out other things, I had experimented. I grew up in the Catholic Church, but I, I, I had been part of a Pentecostal movement and I, uh, I uh, tried transcendental meditation and I, uh, you know, read books about Buddhism and, you know, uh, I was looking, I was searching. Well, there's a definite reason why I'm a member of the Church of Christ. Of course, today, merging with other religious organizations and finding ways to cooperate on various projects, that's quite popular. Let's, let's just forget all of our differences and let's just get together and feed the poor. And you know, that's not a bad thing necessarily. And Baptists or Methodists or Charismatics, I mean, they're good moral people. We share you know, moral convictions uh, with them. Why then should we try to remain distinct? Why should we declare that we're something apart from them. Hey, maybe if we did, people might stop accusing us of thinking we're the only ones going to heaven. <laughs> so I remind 
I reviewed again why I'm a member of the Church of Christ and of those re if those reasons are enough to truly set us apart from other religious groups, both under the heading you know, Christian or other non-Christian groups, you know, why are we special? Why is it different? Why am I here? Why are you here? And so this morning I'd like to share with you three reasons. There are more, I could do a seminar, but I've only got 30 minutes. Three reasons why I am thankful to be a member of the Church of Christ. Reason number one, we have the right Lord. You don't realize how important that is. We have the right Lord. This might seem like a no brainer, but when you step back and you look at the world as a whole, this is very, very important. For example, unbelievers, those who don't believe, their Lord is Satan, whether they know it or not, whether they admit it or not. Those who reject God, those who say there is no God, their Lord is Satan. In Luke chapter four, verses five and six, while Jesus is in the, is in the desert, and Satan is there with him. And Satan himself claims rulership over all the kingdoms of the world. Just look at the newspaper and read through any edition of the newspaper and you will quickly understand who rules this world when you read about what's going on in this world. And then in John 12, 31, where Jesus refers to Satan as the ruler of this world. Make no mistake, Satan rules this world. So this group who by default has Satan as ruler makes up the majority of the world at this time. Their Lord is Satan, whether they know it or not, whether they agree or not. Then there are those who believe in a form of God that they themselves have created or their ancestors have created a thousand years ago. Eastern religions that see God as some kind of impersonal power. Pagan religions that imagine God as some form of nature or animal or superhuman of some kind. These make up a large percentage of the world as well. You see uh, in India, uh, they're using the Hindu religion as a, a political uh, tool in order to unify the country around Hinduism. They're not, they're not crazy, those politicians. They're doing what the Romans did. <laughs> they set up emperor worship as the way to unify the Roman Empire because it was so broad, it was so wide. There wasn't one single thing that could unify the people. And the, the leader said, hey, emperor worship. Everybody's going to worship the emperor. That's how we're going to unify the Roman uh, Empire. Oh, they're doing the same thing in India today. That's why uh, Christianity, for example, uh, is being targeted as well as in Islam. Any other religion is being targeted. Why? Because they're using the Hindu religion in order to unify the people uh, politically. Millions of people, millions of people uh, believe this, are followers of this. There are also millions who have been fooled into believing in a God that rejects Jesus Christ as Lord. Their religion is based completely on removing Christ as savior. Really, you say? There are religions like that in the world? Uh-huh. Well, what could that be? Have you ever studied Islam? What do you think that religion is about? Muslims remove Christ. They acknowledge him. I mean, they can't deny history. <laughs> but they don't acknowledge that he is the Lord. They don't have him as Lord. Closer to home, we have 
uh, as part of our own communities, uh, religious groups like the Jehovah Witnesses, for example, who reduce Christ to the position of an angel. He's an angel. People are saying, oh my goodness, we're talking about people we know now, aren't we getting a little too close to home? I mean, Lisa and I and our family, one of, one of our nephews, he's a Jehovah Witness. Jesus Christ is not his Lord any more than uh, the Hamas uh, in the Middle East. Jesus Christ is not their Lord. And the majority of the one billion plus people who live in India, Jesus Christ is not their Lord. And in China, Jesus Christ is not their Lord. As you can see, those who call Jesus Lord are in the minority. Now the Church of Christ, by its very name, honors the one who has been honored by God as Lord, as divine, as the Christ. Of course, we're not the only ones to do this. But for now, what is important is that the Church of Christ publicly acknowledges Jesus Christ as the Lord, the King, the Savior, the living divine Son of God. I am happy to be a member of a church that is not ashamed to confess the name of Jesus Christ. Because if we confess his name before men, he will confess our name before the Father and the angels of heaven, Matthew 10, uh, verse 32. And of course, the Bible says, there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved, Acts chapter four, verse 12. Do you realize the import of that statement? Do you realize the impact of that statement? That statement is a once for all statement about who is the Lord concerning uh, the scriptures. I'll read it again. There is no other name. Well, how about so? no other name? But what about the billion people who call on it? No other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved, period. Therefore, I'm glad to be a part of the church that openly acknowledges as Lord, the only one that can save all men, and that is Jesus Christ. Number two, why I am a member of the Church of Christ. We've got the right book. We've got the right book. From the very beginning, God's people have always been a people whose lives and practice have been based solely on God's word. This was true of the Israelites in the Old Testament who were warned not to stray from God's commands by Moses in Deuteronomy chapter seven. Uh, verse 11, and it remained true for the first century Christians, encouraged to make the effort to abide strictly to the teachings of Jesus as recorded by the apostles and given to the church once and for all time, as Jude 3 uh, tells us. There is no more, but what if, uh, what if the scientists you know, go and they dig something up and all of a sudden they dig up another uh, a manuscript? You know? There is no more. But what if a church you know, in, in the Holy Land has kept a relic for a thousand years and it, it's, an extra, uh, it's an extra letter from Peter? There is no more. If we only stuck to just that, there would be so many less mistakes, so many less false doctrines based 
on the idea that man has discovered new information that God has given. And yet God has been very clear, there is no more. John warned all future generations that God did not permit any deletions, no additions, no changes to his word. Revelation 22, 18 uh, to 20. What is it that we don't understand about this idea that we can't change the word or make it say something uh, that it doesn't say? And Jesus himself reminded all disciples that in the end, everyone would be judged according to his word as he had spoken it. So we needed to learn it, we needed to teach it, we need to pass it on without change. As uh, uh, John says in 1248, he who rejects me, rather Jesus says, uh, he who rejects me and does not receive my sayings has one who judges him. The word I spoke is what will judge him at the last day. Don't be nervous about, wow, how am I going to be judged? Just read your Bibles. It'll tell you how you'll be judged. And in Matthew 28, 20, in the Great Commission, at the very end, Jesus tells the apostles, teaching them, teaching the new Christians, teaching the new disciples, teaching them to do what? To observe all that I commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. It is quite a comfort then to know that the Church of Christ not only considers the Bible the inspired word of God, but it accepts only the Bible as the inspired word of God. Unlike, for example, our uh, Mormon friends or our Catholic friends or our Pentecostal uh, neighbors who accept other books or other authoritative teachers, or modern day prophets, or so-called faith healers, as legitimate spokesmen for God, who bring new information. And as we have said before, there is no new information. We have all the information. I am happy to be in a church that accepts only one Lord, Jesus Christ, and only one authority in matters of religion, and that is the Bible. As Daxton read this morning in Ephesians 4, 4 to, 6, 4 to 6, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Nothing has changed since Moses. God's people are those that know his word, obey his word, preserve his word, teach his word, just as it has been given. I'm not saying that we're the only ones who say this, but after examining many groups, I have come to the conclusion that not all who say this are actually doing it. That's the problem. I was part of a church at one time that said that they were a Bible church but in that church, women got up and preached uh, on Sunday. Uh, they, they hardly ever took communion. It was a once in a while thing, once a year thing. In that church, they forbade people from eating certain foods. And you needed the permission of the leaders in order to marry a certain individual. All things that were contrary to what the Bible teaches. What saved my spiritual life as I was for many years searching was that I kept reading the Bible, just the Bible. And I would compare the Bible to what the group that I happened to be part of, what they were doing. And the group that I was part of at one time was rolling around on the floor and they were saying things and talking in, in, in some kind of gibberish that no one could understand. And as I continued to read the Bible, I could see nowhere in the New Testament where people were doing that. And when I confronted the leaders about how come it doesn't say that you're doing stuff that there's no answer for it, uh, in the New Testament, where do you get this stuff? And the answer was, you don't understand. 
ah. The same answer that the priest told me at the Catholic Church when I asked him the same question. How come you do stuff that's not in this book? You don't understand. I can't see every church, obviously, but one accusation that has never been made against the Church of Christ, and there have been many accusations, but one accusation that has never been made is that we're doing or teaching something that's unbiblical. We may be too zealous, we might be judgmental, but no one has ever said, you people just continue to teach things that are not in the scripture. Nobody has ever accused us of doing that. Oh, people say we're narrow-minded, uh, we're zealous about church attendance, we're old-fashioned in worship, maybe legalistic at times, but never once has anyone accused or demonstrated that we're doing or teaching something contrary to the teachings of Jesus Christ. Unfortunately, by comparison, it is almost too easy to find unbiblical practices in so-called Bible churches today. So I'm happy to be a member of a church that is known for its Bible accuracy and devotion to careful obedience of God's word in every area of life. There may be others who do the same out there, but we have a reputation for it. People used to say, and I hope will continue to say in the future, oh, you're the Bible people, right? Yeah, that's us. We're the Bible people. And so I'm happy to be a member of the church, church that has the right Lord, the right book. One more. We also have the right approach. One of the sad things about the present generation is that they have no appreciation for our past, for our heritage. The churches of Christ are a product of the restoration movement of the 18th and 19th centuries, beginning in Europe and then quickly spreading across America. This movement was led by men who courageously proclaimed that we should throw off the chains of tradition and non-biblical authority and return to the pristine waters of the inspired word of God in order to become and live as Christians and Christians only. We say that now we go, yeah, sure, of course, isn't that, doesn't everybody know that? But back in the 18th century, boy, if you were to say a thing like that, you were out. If you were a Presbyterian preacher and you said, let's get back to the Bible, let's chop off all the stuff that's not scriptural that we do, let's just go back to the scriptures and just obey the scriptures, you lost your job. In those days, you had to have a license, like being a doctor, you had to have a license to preach. You lost your license. You were banned. It took a lot of courage to stand up and say a thing like that. This was a radical idea at the time, but it captured the minds and the hearts of a young nation searching for a fresh religious identity in Christ. And that message, that restoration message that let's go back to the Bible, that message, it spread like wildfire in the United States. Their great contributions and the ones that truly set us apart from our evangelical friends are the following. First, they reintroduced the biblical idea of restoration to the church. Basically, they demonstrated that in order to remain faithful, sinful people had to continually pursue the restoration of biblical Christianity from generation to generation. Of course, we see this principle at work throughout the Bible and history. For example, Seth restored the worship of God after it had been abandoned by previous generations. Noah restored what was destroyed by a corrupt world. 
Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob restored God's promise from generation to generation. Moses restored the people's freedom. Joshua restored their land. The kings and the prophets continued the cycle of fall and restoration and faithfulness until Jesus would come. The apostles provided the church with Jesus' words, which were to be maintained until he returned. And the history of the church since then has continued this cycle of restoring God's people to a pure teaching and living of God's word. Always a cycle of drawing near to God by a more converted effort to live closer to his word. That's the cycle of restoration. And the point that I'm making is that this generation right here is in danger of, of losing the zeal of the restoration. In the Middle Ages, the Reformation was an effort to restore the purity of the word within the Catholic Church, but it only partially succeeded. In the 19th and 20th centuries, another effort was made to restore the purified form of Christianity based only on God's word. And the churches of Christ, they're the product, we're the product of that effort. The thing that separates us from other groups really is that we are the only ones dedicated to continually purifying and restoring biblical Christianity. You go to your friend, you go to some Methodist church, you go to a, across the street, you go somewhere else and you ask them, What's the goal? What are you shooting for? What are you trying? And they'll say, well, we want to be good Christians or we want to be faithful or we want to serve our neighbors or we want to have, a, uh, we want to have a edifying worship. And all of that is part of the, it's part of the whole. But the mission, what's the mission? The mission is to purify and to restore biblical Christianity in every generation. What are we teaching our children? What are, we, what are we pointing them towards? What are we encouraging? Why are we here? This is like a, a theological compass that always helps us find true north. No matter how far left or right we go, the restoration idea always helps us to find true direction. This congregation might start to skip a little leftwards, if you wish, or might go a little too far right, but the idea of following biblical Christianity is the tool that always sets us straight, is always, it gets us back on the right road. Somebody, somewhere, somehow, at some time will say, hey, let's get back to the Bible. Uh, let's get rid of all this stuff that doesn't count for anything. Let, let's get back to the scripture. Isn't that who we are? Somebody says that at some time or other in the life uh, of a church. No other major church group has this feature. And so when a religious body or organization begins to stray from biblical teaching, there is nothing to bring them back. So they start with one change and then they add another change and then they skip this change and then they drop this doctrine and pretty soon they're just as far away as they could be from the original point. When we start to go in that direction, hopefully the elders will say, ah, 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 ah we're starting to slide. This is, not, this is not restoration Christianity. This is not biblical Christianity. We need to kind of, you know, uh, a course correction, that's what I was looking for. We need to make a course correction and get back on track. Others don't have this. They just keep adding stuff. This is why there are over 200 different subgroups among our Baptist friends, for example. The restoration principle, that theological compass, makes us unique, it sets us apart. The great danger in today's generation is that we are largely failing in teaching this 
to our young adults and to our teens and we risk becoming like all the others because we've abandoned our restoration ideals. We've stopped using and teaching the next generation how to use the compass. Another thing that sets us apart is the fact that these people, they gave us good Bible study tools. You know, these restoration leaders of the past good hermeneutics, if you wish. The reason we can come to concise and consistent conclusions about the Bible is because they developed simple ways to study it and to arrive at conclusions in a consistent manner. Their method was best described in the motto, we speak where the Bible speaks and we are silent where the Bible is silent. Now that's not in the Bible, but that's a great, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, directive to help us study the Bible. In other words, they taught us to do or to copy those things that the Bible commanded or taught by example or demonstrated by logical conclusion. In other words, if you could base your teaching or your practice on something in the Bible that you had divine authority for, you were solid. Why do you think we preach about baptism so convicted? convincingly, so assuredly, because there's so much teaching about it in the New Testament. I know I'm right, not because I'm smart. I know I'm right because it's so easily evident in the New Testament that baptism is part of the process of salvation. I mean, it's mentioned 10 times in the book of Acts alone, 10. However, Anything that was not biblically sanctioned was left to a matter of judgment or opinion. Good common sense rules to help us do Bible things in Bible ways, to make sure that God's people were doing God's will according to God's word. For hundreds of years, the Church of Christ has maintained unity, has done the Lord's work, has grown throughout the world without any headquarters. No human head, there's no big boss. Who's the big boss in the Church of Christ? Well, Jesus. <laughs> but other than that, there's no, uh, in our local churches, there's no head elder, is there? Is there a chief elder? No, there are elders. None of them is the head elder. Some try to be the head elder, but that's not biblical, right? And we've been able to do this simply because its members have humbled themselves to simply use a biblical approach to studying and carrying out God's word in their lives and in the church. So we share many resemblances to churches who say that Christ is their Lord. There's no doubting this, our buildings are alike you tell people, you know, you come into church Sunday? Yeah, we're at the corner of Reno and Choctaw, but there are three church built. Which one is yours? Well, we usually say the one with the green roof, you know, because the building, you know, oh, there's three church buildings. They kind of look alike, don't they? And we use similar words, worship, service, communion. You know, we use the same words. And we share similar levels of morality. Uh, 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 adultery is a sin here, and I'm very sure across the street, adultery is a sin. And so is adultery a sin over in our uh, other congregation uh, across that street. We share a moral you know, level of morality. We share those, we share those things. And we call on the same Lord. I have no doubt that the folks across the street are calling on the Lord Jesus Christ. But there are differences that are deep and important and should never be uh, uh, overlooked. One is we are devoted to the careful preservation and obedience of his word. Many say this, but their unbiblical practices deny what they claim. That's the point. The proof is in the pudding. The proof is in the actions. 
you say you're following the Bible, but if you say that, how come you're doing things that are not in the Bible? And then secondly, we can demonstrate that everything we teach, everything we do, and the way we do it is based on the Bible, and we do so because the Bible says we must do so. See, that's the point in 2 Timothy 1 verse 13, retain the standard of sound words which you have heard from me in the faith and love which are in Christ Jesus, 2 Timothy 1 13. What is Paul saying? Retain the standard of sound words. What are the sound words? Well, the teachings of Jesus. Where did he hear them? He heard them from Paul. Paul is saying to Timothy, maintain that, do that, obey that, and then teach others to do the same thing and teach others so that they'll teach the next generation and so on and so on and so forth. Some people say, why do you do this? Why is this so important? Because the Bible tells us we ought to be doing this. That's why we do it. And then thirdly, we are preparing the next generation to preserve uh, these values and search to purify and refine more perfectly the church that we pass on to them. I want the Choctaw Church of Christ to be more pure and more devoted and more exact in following uh, the, 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 the word of the Lord than it was in my generation. And the future generation should want the same thing for their children, that it be better and more pure, more effective and more wholly devoted uh, to God. Most other uh, churches struggle to fit in to the changing society of the future. We struggle to preserve the church as Jesus established it in the New Testament. I'm not worried about fitting into the new society. I'm not worried about that. I'm worried about keeping the church as it is, according to the scripture. I'm happy to be and thankful to be a member of the church that places such a high priority on purity and obedience and perseverance and love. Isn't this the church that you want to be a member of? Brothers and sisters, it's more than just a piano in the auditorium. It's about truly being the church that God designed, that Jesus died for, that the apostles established, that the Holy Spirit describes in his word. Are you a member of that church? The Bible says that in order to be a member of the church of Christ, you must believe in the gospel confess Christ, repent of your sins, and be baptized uh, in his name. Why? Because in Acts 2.37 it says, now when they heard this, the they were the people who were listening to Peter preach his sermon. When they heard this, they were pierced to the heart. What does that mean? It means they felt guilty. Why did they feel guilty? Because Peter accused them of being the ones who put Christ to death. Of course, they killed their own Messiah. Of course they felt guilty. And so they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brethren, what shall we do? I mean, we're dead, we're toast. We, 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 we've, we've, we've murdered our own savior. What do we do now? And Peter said to them, repent. Repent of what? Well, you were disbelievers and you hated Christ. Repent of that. Become believers, become followers of Jesus in your hearts. And each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Brothers and sisters, if there was ever a time for him to say, what shall we do? Well, just come on forward or raise your hand or accept Jesus as your personal savior or clap three times, or get on your knees, or put your head down to the ground on your knees towards the east. If there was ever a time to give an instruction, this was the time. And yet, what did Peter say? Peter said to them, repent 
and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. My prayer is that if anybody ever asks you whether you're 12 years old, 15 years old, 50 years old, or 150 years old, if anybody ever asks you, what should I do to become a Christian? You will respond exactly what Peter responded. Repent and be baptized. And then in verse 41, it says, so then those who had received his word, in other words, those who believed it, were baptized. And that day there were added about 3,000 souls. Lots of people baptized. There were a lot of people there on that day that weren't baptized. They didn't accept uh, the word. This is not what other churches teach, but this is what the Bible teaches. And my question is, who are you going to believe? Who are you going to obey? The Bible says, if you want to be restored, for example, if you're a Christian and you've sinned and you've wandered away and you want to be restored, you have to confess your sins and pray for forgiveness and walk in the light. How do we know that? One last example, in 1 John 1, 9, what does it say? If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's for Christians. I don't know how many Christians have said, I feel bad, I feel guilty. And I've said, have you confessed your sin? Well, I, I, I've thought about it a lot. No, 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 have you confessed it? Have you named it? I lied, I knew I lied, I knew if I would lie it would cause trouble, but I did it anyway. That's confessing your sin. Have you confessed your sin? Have you asked God to forgive you? Well, not really, not exactly. Well, how about exactly doing that? And exactly receiving what the Bible says you will receive. It says right here, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins. Well, which sins? All of our sins. Yeah, but that was pretty bad. What I, that adultery thing, man, that was pretty bad. I don't know. Which sins? All sins. And to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Why, why, didn't he, why didn't he just stop it? Forgive us our sins. Because we needed to know that our conscience would be clean. That's why it's to cleanse us from all right, unrighteousness. We need to know that the forgiveness is real. So, are you, are you ready to just obey the word of Christ in order to be a member of the church of Christ? And like me, truly know why you are a member of this church and not some other group? This is all we'll ever ask of you to do here, nothing else. Read God's word and obey it. That's the only thing we ask of you. If you need to obey God's word, in a way that you never have before, then we encourage you to come forward now and do that in whatever way you need to as we stand and as we sing our song of encouragement. Shall we do that now, please?